Heavenly Father, I pray you open up our hearts to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to your people today. May we leave here transformed all because of your word and the power of your Holy Spirit. We give you all the honor for what you do today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Open your Bibles to John chapter 20 and verse 11. And we're going to dig into the resurrection appearance of of Jesus to Mary Magdalene. And, and, And this is actually his first resurrection appearance. It says, Mary was standing outside. Now, some of us are old enough to remember the assassination of JFK. Others of us are old enough to remember the assassination of Martin Luther King. More recently, the nation paused at the death of of, of Kobe Bryant, a a living legend cut down at his prime. Too young, too strong, too soon. And likewise, Mary was in the middle of a national crisis, and she was standing outside. The man who did things that no man had ever done, the man who spoke like no other man had ever spoken, The man who was like no other man she had ever known. The only man that could have ever fairly condemned her took the time to actually free her of her demons. And she was standing outside the tomb crying. Feelings of powerlessness, helplessness in the face of such brutality that she had witnessed just a few days before over whelmed her, and despite her years of learning at Jesus' feet, she really couldn't find the words to to express what she felt, and and all she could do was was, was weep. Sometimes the the most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't said, and sometimes we don't really have words to say, but God hears our groans. And as she wept, Aristotle says that crying— cleans the mind. And Mary was, was trying here to get her equilibrium back after, you know, being emotionally sideswapped by, by, by what felt like a ton of bricks when Jesus was crucified. And she, she stood there and, and she wept. And the Bible says she also then stooped. And what we see here is the entrance to the, 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 the cave or the tomb was low. And some spiritual places are so high that the only way we can enter is to bow. You know, a a strong woman may may, may work out to keep her body in shape, but a woman of strength knows how to kneel down to keep her soul in shape. And this is what Mary did. She stooped and she looked in. Some of the greatest lessons that I've learned in my life were when my, my face were still wet from tears. And in these moments, I had to choose to, 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 to either look away from God in self-pity or like Mary, kneel down and take another look at Jesus. And the secret to standing up is really kneeling often. When she looked to find Jesus, she saw two robed angels But she didn't really care much about the presence of angels. Only thing she was concerned about was the absence of her Lord. If we could be more like Mary. You'll never know like Mary that God is all you need until God is really all you have. And Jesus was really all this woman had. And and when he was gone, her whole world was was taken away. But when she looked in and and she stooped down, she saw two white-robed angels One sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. And just as the the angels on the Ark of the Covenant, where they were at the top of the Ark with, 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 with angel wings touching, they were there to protect the presence of God. And the Old Testament uh, talks about that in many different places, how these angels protected the presence. The reason why these two angels here 
stood at the head and the feet of Jesus because Jesus himself was the presence of God. And, and finally, the imagery of the mercy seat all of a sudden made sense. And, and after thousands of years of mystery and Jewish people wondering, what, what is represented on that mercy seat? It all came alive in that moment for this uneducated and, 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 and uh, mourning woman. And the angel said, dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. You see, they were trying to help her see that despite what she was feeling and what had just transpired, there's always more hope than we realize. I, I, I couldn't begin to count the number of times that, that, that I thought it was over. I, I looked at my situation, I'm like, there's no way I could ever come back from that. But God showed up telling me to trust his, his plan over my pain. And this was the situation with Mary. She had to trust God's plan over her pain. And this is what we must learn to do in crisis. Trust his plan over our pain. She said, well, the reason I'm crying, guys, is because they've taken away my Lord. She didn't denigrate him and call him anything less than what he was, Lord. And sometimes in our pain, we, we, we call things, God, things that, 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 that we should not. In, in, in the midst of disappointment and not quite understanding all that happened, she still called him Lord. In the midst of your disappointment, in the midst of, of things not going right for you, the way you plan, remember to continue to call him Lord. She said, because they've taken away my Lord. She wanted to finish anointing Jesus with the, the aloes, and, 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 the, aloes and, and, and the spices that they, they started on, on, on Friday night, but the problem was the Sabbath was drawing near and they weren't to work on, on the Sabbath. And, and an honorable burial is very, very important in, in the ancient world. Matter of fact, not to be buried properly was actually to be under a curse. But again, on, on, on Friday night, the, 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 the women had to rush and finish everything before the Sabbath. And she replies, because she wants to finish, I don't know where they have put him. Beginners are many, but finishers a few. This woman would not leave until she was done. This was the type of woman that God had made Mary. She might not have gotten everything that happened, but nothing was going to stop her from showing her last kindness to the best man, the most gentlest man that she had ever known. There was no way that she was going to let Jesus go out like that. She didn't understand the resurrection, but she honored the Lord and, and, and she, she valued him and, and she, she's doing everything humanly possible. To, to, to not uh, pour, pour, pour salt in the wound or insult to injury. He's already been crucified, but she wants to make sure that he had an honorable burial. Verse 14, she turned to leave. So Mary was focused. Even two strange men in, in the grave. Now, this is a strange place to meet these men that she didn't know because, again, only the people that were most intimate to, to Jesus would, would come to, to, to the gravesite. And he, she didn't expect to see anyone that she didn't know because she had followed him for years now. But even these two men at, at the, the gravesite could not take her off of mission. You can chase your goals or your distractions, but you can't chase both. She was focused and she was going after what was important to her. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. She wanted to offer her, her last act of worship to Jesus. But here's the deal. It's hard to see what you don't expect. One more time. It's hard to see what you don't expect. Someone was standing behind her. Maybe she saw something on the face of the angels, an acknowledgement. I'm not quite sure what happened, but as she turned, someone was standing behind her, and it was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. You see, the last time she saw him, he was bloodied, mangled, wounded, matted, disfigured. The Bible says all of his bones were out of joint. In fact, Isaiah tells us that he was beaten beyond 
recognition. And what happens with grief is, is grief has a way of altering our perceptions. It magnifies the past and kind of distorts the present and, and often hides our, our future. But despite her state, Mary kept on keeping on. And Jesus says are actually the same words the angels said, which lets you know angels are, uh, real angels are speaking only God's word and God's mind. He said, dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. You see, sometimes we're so busy seeking the dead that we can't see the living. So focused on what's lost, we can't see what's, what's present. And this was her situation, so busy paying attention to what died in her life that she was about to miss what was now alive. Anybody in this place or that's uh, watching identify with, with, with Mary here? You ever feel a little disoriented? You ever struggle with seeing things clearly? Because what has just happened has so impacted your mind that the present doesn't even seem real because the past has, has just hit you, man, with, 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 with such force that you almost can't get it together. This is where Mary was. He said, who are you looking for? Now, these are the first words, according to Scripture, that Jesus spoke after the resurrection. And these are the same words that Jesus has been asking people all over the world ever since. Are you just looking for another dead man that, that had a philosophy? Are you just looking for another uh, dead man that, that, that maybe had some interesting things to say that, that people perhaps still talk about? Or are you looking for just another dead man that knew how to put some words together well? Or are you looking for someone bigger than the grave? Or are you looking for someone bigger than your suffering? Are you looking for someone bigger than death? Are you looking for that someone that's bigger than the worst thing that could ever happen to you? She thought he was the gardener. She couldn't wrap her head around this. The last time she saw him, he looked, again, unrecognizable. Just the fact that it looked like a normal visage, she, she couldn't connect the dots. And again, grief blinds us. Sir, she said, She's still respectful, but she has no time for nonsense. Everyone who knew, everyone knew who had been buried in that grave. All of Jerusalem was talking about it. The nation was talking about it. I mean, who could ask such a silly question in her mind? But she's still respectful. She possesses herself. But she says, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Now, Mary was either an exceptionally large and strong woman who could carry the body of a grown man that had a hundred pounds of wrappings and anointing on his body, or it was the strength of a love that caused her to disregard all her personal weaknesses. I mean, when you really love him, you're really willing to do whatever it takes. And her attitude was, whatever it takes to show honor to my king, whatever it takes to, 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 to try to correct the dishonor that was showed to my Messiah, even if that means I got to find a way to physically carry a man I can't carry, I'm going to get it done. And that's what worship is, doing what you can't do because the cause is so much greater than your inabilities and personal weaknesses. And in verse 16, he says, Mary, this is important. This is the first resurrection appearance. He didn't tell her who he was, but he told her who she was. You see, no one knew Mary, accepted Mary, or helped Mary like Jesus had. And this may surprise you, but the name Mary literally means, watch this, rebellion. I know we name our child Mary, and, and it's important and it's significant even in the birth narrative, but we're not going to talk about that now. But her name literally meant, meant rebellion. Jesus met Mary in her rebellion, 
And he was the only one that didn't try to use it or exploit it against her. He was the only one that helped her and actually turned her rebellion in the right direction. Instead of rebelling against God, she began to rebel against the world. He said, Mary, no one spoke of Mary's new identity the way Jesus did. Everybody who saw her talked about her past, what she used to be and remembered and, and whispered. But this reminds me of, of, of a story I heard. It's been an ugly day, she said. Tell me something beautiful. And he said her name. You see, Mary was not just a statistic. She wasn't just a project or another number in the crowd, another butt in the seat, if you will, just a, another follower that he could, you know, add to his tally. Jesus is a shepherd that calls each of his sheep by name and leads them out. Jesus here loved her as an individual. You are not part of a number. I'm not part of a number. He knows each of our names. He knows where we came from, and he knows where he's taken us. And when he spoke that name, all the light bulbs went off. Suddenly, she snaps out. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Mary was healed of seven demons. But what stands out in this account to me is Mary didn't call him healer, didn't call him deliverer. She chose to call him the title or the word that meant the most to her, the thing that was the most important to Mary, and it was teacher. Jesus not only loved her, but taught her a new way to live. And by the way, at this time in history, men didn't teach women. This was radical for Jesus to teach Mary Magdalene. And in his teaching, what she learned is from Jesus and from Jesus only that her future didn't have to look like her past, just like your future doesn't have to look like your past. And in verse 17, then something real interesting starts to happen. He says, don't cling to me. Now, what I want you to notice right out of the gate was Jesus was not a phantom. This was not just a vision. He was not just a spirit. He was tangible. He was real such that he could be held. So again, this is not just something going on in her mind because she was overwhelmed by events. Jesus literally had a resurrected body in front of her and she could hold him or let go of him. He said, do not or don't cling to me. And this is what I want to focus on today. And this is really important and I, I believe in this season it's what the Lord is saying to each of our hearts. The problem was not that she touched him. The problem was she wouldn't let him go. You see, there was a time when Jesus could rightly be handled. At the Last Supper, the Bible says, John laid his head at Christ's breast. Uh, th there were times when, you know, I, I don't know if they played soccer, volleyball, I don't know what the games were, but, but, but they were games that could be played and, and they could give them high five, they could pat them on the back and, and, and all the rest. But after the cross, everything changed. And we're not ready for the future until we can let go of the past. And she wanted to hold on to him like she, they, they used to be able to in the past. But everything had changed. He was ascending to the right hand of the Father. He would be our, our mediator and intercessor, and, and she had to adjust to the change. And right now, the world is changing around us. Things are changing around us. And if we try to hold on to what was, we can miss what God has for us in the future. He said to her, do not cling to me. Let go and stop trying to keep things the way they once were. The longer you live in the past, the less of the future you have to enjoy. You know, when, when God asks us to change, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's tough at the beginning. And then it's messiest in the middle, but it's always best in the end. 
And here was a major change. Jesus could not be treated as, as the individual that got thirsty, the individual that got tired. He was now in a resurrected body, a resurrected state. He would not be walking dusty roads in the same way he used to. And Mary had to make the adjustment. There was no problem with Mary touching him and, and, and hugging him, but holding on to something he once was, was the, the problem. He said, do not cling to me. Let go of the way it used to be. And then he explains, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. In other words, let me go. Because as good as it was when, when I was with you on earth, it won't compare to what I'm about to do when I release the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit, he will not only be with you, he will be in you. And actually, many of us say, well, I wish I could have lived the times that Jesus walked the earth. The reality is it's better now. Because Jesus could only be on the outside of you. He didn't live on the inside of you. He couldn't help you inside out. He could only maybe correct you, discipline you from the outside in. But, but, but here Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit will come and live on the innermost part of your being and he will speak into your very heart 24 hours, seven days a week. Do not cling to me, Jesus said, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. And what he was saying is, Mary, despite all that just happened, if you're willing to trust, if you're willing to let go, it's about to get better. And what I'm saying to you, despite all that's happening, all that has happened, if you're willing to trust, if you're willing to let go, it's about to get better. God cannot give you something new with you holding on to the past because your hands are full. And I have found, and sometimes these are tough moments, I have to let go of what's in my hand in order for God to release what's in his hand. It takes faith to do that, but Mary had to back up and let go. Relationships may be changing. Circumstances may be changing. God is saying, don't live in the past. Thank God for, for the past, and maybe there were some good things in the past, but we have to go on with God, and we have to have our hands open enough to receive all that God has for us in this new day. And this new day is gonna be brighter, it's gonna be better, and we're going to be stronger. So Jesus wasn't sad about don't cling to me. But listen, lady, I'm trying to get something better to you than you ever had if you just let go of the way things used to be. And I know, you know, we, we, you know there are folks that aren't with us anymore. Perhaps they passed on. There's just a zillion different things. And sometimes we just live in the past. Man, it was so much better then. I'll tell you, until you let that go, you're not going to be experienced. You're not going to be able to experience God's best in, in, in this season. But then he says, but go find my brothers. Jesus flips the whole cultural thing because a woman's, test, a woman's testimony was not really supposed to be taken seriously. The first, first person that preached the gospel was actually this woman, and not just any woman, this wasn't this, uh, you know, this great celebrated woman. This is a woman that seven demons were casted out, meaning she had some behaviors and some issues before she came to Christ. And even as she was with him, she was getting over some of these behaviors and, and, and a whole lifestyle. But she says to this woman, the least, go and tell it. So if God could use someone like Mary, why can't he use you? But go find my brothers. Now, this is the first time in all the scriptures I think it's like over a hundred times Jesus refers to his disciples, but he never refers to them as brothers. He called them children a few times. He called them disciples. He even called them friends. But this is the first time in the scripture that he clearly calls this group his brothers. Why? Because after the ascension, they'd become part of the same heavenly family share the same access and the same love from the same Father. And no invitation is more consequential and more meaningful than inviting someone to be part of your family. There was nothing more intimate that Jesus could have asked them to be than the, his, his brothers. He said, go find my brothers. I know they're hiding. I know they're afraid. I know they don't get it. I know I taught them, but they, they, they don't get it. I, I know. Go find them and tell them. And he gave 
her the message that he wanted preached to them. Tell them I'm ascending to my father, watch this, and your father, to my God, watch this, and your God. He said to the men that abandoned him when he needed them most, the Garden of Gethsemane, he's like, hey, my, my soul's overwhelming me to the point of death. He never needed the disciples before. It, nowhere in the Bible did it really seem like he needed the, the disciples, but that last night in Gethsemane where he dropped sweat droplets of blood, he needed the disciples and they fall asleep. Then, after, you know what, he prays by himself, he gets through that moment, the soldiers come and arrest him, and the Bible says all of the disciples flee. They all abandon him as he was arrested. And then to make matters worse, the lead disciple, while after he was, well, actually uh, before his, his, his crucifixion, not only betrayed him once, but he betrayed him three times before the rooster crowed. But he still invited these men to be part of his family, saying, my father is now your father. My God is now your God. And this is what Resurrection Sunday is all about. Jesus died so that his father could become your father. His God could become your God. All that he went through in that terrible Friday it's for you and for me. So in this last moment, I don't want you to just flip off or this is important. This is about your soul. Jesus came not because he didn't have anything better to do, but because he loved you. In this moment, if your heart's beating fast and, and, and you, you could sense that, that God's calling you, don't miss your moment. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you don't pray with me in this moment, please call the 1-800 number and, and, and get someone to pray with you. But, but I'd really rather you right now pray with me. Would you just bow your head right now and say, Heavenly Father, I know that Jesus died for my sins. He took my shame and my punishment, and I'm so grateful. I ask, Father, that the Spirit of the Lord Jesus would come and live on the inside of me. Father, I want to be born afresh and anew. I want a new life. I want everything Jesus died that I might receive. I want the forgiveness of sin, Father. I want to learn how to live a holy and righteous life. Lord, you know, I'm going to mess up. I know I'm going to do things, but, but Lord, I want to learn. I'm open, Father. If, if you would just come on the inside and, and begin to commune with me and, and, and talk with me, and, and Father, I, I'm hungry for you and, and I'm open. If you're willing to meet me in this moment, I'm willing to be yours. If you just say that with me, I, I'm willing to be yours, Lord. Receive me, Lord. I give my life to you, Lord. I accept the Lord Jesus right now, all of his work, all that he's ever done. I receive it in my life right now. If you say that out loud, not just in your heart, but with your mouth, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Change my life. God will hear you. And your life, your eternity will never, ever be the same.